Okay, hello, hi, hello everyone. Okay, good evening. I am Rachel, I'm with the Progressive Change Campaign Committee. Thank you so, so much for carving out some time to join us tonight. First, on behalf of the entire P-Trip team, thank you for joining us. Uh, we hope you're staying safe, you and your families, uh, keeping healthy and, and as positive as, as possible. So before I turn over to our co-founder, Adam Green, uh, to say a few words about Morgan, we really want this call to be interactive. I think we're all craving that now. Uh, so to that end, we'd love it if you would all turn on your videos uh, so we can all see each other's bright faces. Uh, and we will also request that you uh, turn on your video as, as well if you're comfortable with that. Um, so when you're ready to ask your question, Morgan is, is eager to hear all your thoughts and answer your questions. So when you're ready to do that, please go to the very bottom of your screen. In the center of it, you'll see an icon that says chat and you'll see something that says Rachel PCC host. So you'll click on that and you'll send me your question, and it'll be directly sent to me. Feel free to send me your question at any point. Uh, and we, when we start the Q&A section portion, I'll call your name, uh, I'll request uh, to unmute you, and then we'll spotlight your video. So uh, we will see you and you can directly ask Morgan your question. So one final note before we dig in, uh, if you like what you hear uh, from Morgan, which we think you will, uh, we would love of you to consider a, a contribution to help fuel Morgan's campaign. Um, and we'll make that easy for you all to do. We'll send it to you in a, in a chat. Uh, if that's something you can consider, we would greatly appreciate uh, that. So with that, let me turn it, to, uh, turn it over to our co-founder, Adam Green. Adam? Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, hi, everybody, this is so exciting. Uh, on behalf of myself and my co-founder, Stephanie Taylor, and our whole PCCC team, we are so thrilled to be doing this first Meet the Candidates call with one of our favorite candidates, Morgan Harper, running in Ohio's third district. Uh, it's great to see so many friends um, and supporters, allies on this Zoom, as well as my mom. Hi, mom. I see you. Um, so, <laughs> all family here. Um, you know, we, we consistently have heard about Morgan Harper all year. I've actually first heard about her from one of our good allies who used to work at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau with Elizabeth Warren, who said, you, you have to hear about Morgan Harper. She's running for Congress. She's amazing. And then there was more chatter and more chatter about that. And eventually, we finally got a chance to meet her. And it was such a pleasure. She actually came to our candidate training when we did one in the Midwest this past year. Um, and she just knocked everyone's socks off as she practiced her stump speech in, in front of 100 other candidates. And uh, resulted, it resulted in a ruckus applause as people were so impressed by her ability to both uh, campaign on her values and do it so eloquently. Um, and I also had a great opportunity to see her speak at a fundraiser here in DC and was just mesmerized by the way that she connected her personal story to the values that we all hold so dear. And truly, you know, if there is a second squad and if she is elected to Congress, we are convinced that she will be a top leader in that squad too. Um, you know, she's running in a very democratic district against an incumbent Democrat who she was able to out fundraise for a significant portion of last year, which is huge and a testament to her grassroots support and smart campaigning. Um, the other Democrat, you know, is not fully living up to how democratic this district is, you know, actively telling the New York Times that things like Medicare for all or Green New Deal are a pipe dream. Um, we can do better in a very blue district and we're not just doing better. We have a truly inspirational candidate in Morgan Harper. Um, you know, she is someone who has, I can tell you, you know, her own personal story and life story, the values that she's campaigning on in the district, um, but she is truly painting a picture of what progressive values will look like and also showing people what a progressive uh, grassroots campaign looks like. I'm told that a Zoom call is not a Zoom call without special effects. So before I turn things over to Morgan, I just want to um, see if I could do something that is testament to her grassroots campaigning. Let's see how this works. Okay, uh, uh, no, okay. Well, it said Morgan Eyes, but, but it just says Gan. So, Morgan, you, you, you can. <laughs> you that was quasi special. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so, you can tell people how you're Morganizing on the ground there. But thank you so much for joining us, for being so inspirational. And without further ado, Morgan Harper from Ohio. Thanks, Morgan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Adam, and thank you, Rachel and Claire, for organizing. And I also have to shout out my campaign manager slash 
good friend from college who I dragged to Columbus, Ohio to help me run this campaign, Cecilia Dos Santos, who is also logged in. I uh, want to thank PCCC, who has been such a great support for our campaign uh, all along the way, and especially in this extra innings portion that we've gotten that I'll, I'll talk about a little later. And thanks to all of you for joining. This is really cool, especially in the corona era, to be able to connect with anyone, really, throughout the day, other than uh, my fiance, <laughs> though I love him, and, uh, and especially people who are still willing to learn more about our race and potentially support. So I thank you, and I'm glad that you all are healthy and well enough to join us today. My name's Morgan Harper. I'm running to represent the 3rd Congressional District of Ohio in US Congress, as Adam was saying. And how I got to this point has a lot to do with how I began in this community. I was born here at the Ohio State University Hospital 36 years ago, uh, given up for adoption. I lived in a foster home as an infant and then was adopted and raised on the east side, probably by my mother who immigrated to Ohio from Trinidad and was a public school teacher. And we went through a lot as a family early on, but um, a lot of those struggles also, in some ways ironically, opened up the opportunity for me to get financial aid to go to this elite college prep school here in central Ohio, and really stopped me in my tracks at age 10 to the reality that is the United States of America, that just based on who your parents are and if they have money, and what school district or zip code neighborhood you're born into can really determine the outcomes of your life. And especially being someone who's adopted, that just struck me as fundamentally unfair and, and put me on a mission to do something about everybody getting a fair shot um, and also understanding the systems that have created this reality. So I pursued a career in public policy, became a lawyer. I worked in Washington, as Adam mentioned, at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where I really understood how government works and, and in many ways for the first time had a, a true model of the federal government working for the people uh, in the CFPB. And, um, but my other main takeaway from my time in Washington was that the big reason why people have this skepticism of the government, particularly at the federal level, and why we don't see more action and legislation out of there that feels like it's having a profound impact on people's lives and getting at that vision of everyone having a fair shot is that we have had a generation of corporate uh, driven political leadership that is overwhelmed by that, um, that influence of corporate interests and, and truly isn't serving to work for the people every single day. And if we're going to get at that, and ultimately not just fair shot, but like a lot of the issues that we saw at the CFPB that amount to people just not having enough money fundamentally, it's going to take an entirely different style of of political leadership. And so that's a big reason why we launched this campaign on July 1st of last year. Um, it is not common to run a grassroots campaign in, in Ohio, uh, especially for a federal office. And I heard pretty much every reason under the sun why this would not work. Uh, not only would it not work, but it would be the end of my career in Ohio in politics or in a lot of other fields that I might want to pursue um, because of the machine culture here. And in fact, we kept pushing because I really believed very strongly in the people of this district, the people of this community that gave my whole life a shot. And I knew that they saw what I saw, that what we're doing isn't working, that in many ways it's becoming harder and harder even before the corona uh, pandemic to get by. And, uh, and we can't continue on in this way. And so we have been able to fundraise. That was the first way, and as I'm sure a lot of you know, the first marker of the viability, uh, quote unquote, of a campaign. And, uh, and we did outraise my opponent, who is a career politician married into a generational career political family um, by almost $100,000 in that first quarter. We've now raised almost $800,000 overall. And, uh, and still our average contribution has been $55. So it really has been incredible, even to me who's running, um, just to see the level of support we've gotten from 93% of the zip codes that make up our district, but then also from all 50 states all over the country. Um, and you know, the other key uh, variable I would say that's shown we have a real shot here is um, is just the level of engagement. And you know, particularly before the pandemic, when we were all still able to gather, and even early in our campaign in August, when we first launched a campaign office, we had you know 100 people showing up months from before our election to hit the streets and canvassing. We knocked over 30,000 doors from you know, mid-January mid -January 
uh, when we finally got someone with any congressional campaign experience. So we had just had such an amazing outreach operation. A lot of that had to do with the branding, like the Morganize hashtag that Adam mentioned at the beginning. It wasn't just a clever little play on my name. It really was this principle that if we're going to change the political landscape of central Ohio, of Ohio, uh, bring progressive values here, then we have to organize our entire community and organize it. And this isn't just about getting Morgan Harper elected to Congress and we call it a day. And in fact, that's been something I've cared about my whole life. My own individual success means virtually nothing if it doesn't lead to really the equality for everyone and that everyone's getting that shot. And so we need everyone to be engaging in this political process if we're gonna get there. And we, we have been organizing. And that's been a way to also show people that we're meeting them where they're at. We've been going into spaces that typically folks aren't used to hearing from politicians. I went to clubs and got the mic from DJs early on in the campaign, was able to just talk for two minutes about why we were running this race and got people to pay attention and people respecting that we were willing to go into those spaces and weren't just waiting for someone to show up, that we were doing weekly community rallies and anyone could come and ask me any question. And particularly in this culture that we have here of the machine traditional style of politics where every moment is scripted, every question is vetted. Uh, it, it took people aback a little bit. It's like, wow, is this for real? You know, we just ask you anything. And I'm like, yeah, I mean it. And maybe I don't have all the answers, but I'll be honest about it. And, and I'll get back to you. Uh, and so we're keeping that all the way, you know, to our now a new election day. So the latest update on our campaign, and I'll then, you know, pause and, and see if we have any questions, is uh, we got a big surprise in the, as we all did in many ways with the pandemic, not really knowing uh, what was going to happen day to day. But for us, our election day fell right in the middle of a lot of states, and particularly our state here, Ohio, coming to grips with what the risk was of this disease and the decision was made to postpone our election at first to an unknown date there have been a few different dates that were floated around but ultimately the state legislature landed on april 28th being our new date and that it was going to be all mail-in voting so no in-person voting option um, so the only votes that have been cast in person so far were those people that showed up to early vote before March 17th, because Ohio has three weeks of early voting. And then anyone who submitted an absentee ballot before that date, and now anyone who's trying to vote after March 17th uh, will have to do so by absentee ballot. And I'll say a little bit there, especially as we're now having this national conversation about potentially having mail-in voting for the general election for um, president in particular in November is, Absentee voting will probably come as no surprise for people who follow Ohio politics is not a straightforward process. And so we are trying to do the best we can to educate people about this multi-step effort it takes to vote by mail here that we're asking people to understand and navigate in the midst of all of these life changes that are happening right now. So the, the basic steps are you have to submit an application to receive an absentee ballot that doesn't come to you automatically. So you have to submit an application provide your own postage to then mail that into the Board of Elections to get your absentee ballot, which will then have prepaid postage. And then you fill that out and then you send that back in as well. So there, there are about you know, four steps that you have to go through to vote by mail here. For a lot of people, this is gonna be the first time that they've ever voted absentee. For us in particular as a campaign, we had been targeting a lot of non-traditional voters in, uh, in our target universe. And so even more so, probably the type of person that if you put up a barrier or two to any new behavior, they're just not gonna do it. And so we've had to get really creative in our outreach over these past two and a half weeks uh, to make sure that people continue to vote. And that's involved launching a full-on enfranchisement campaign of, uh, well, I like to call them fuchsia or magenta envelopes. I am wearing our campaign color, which are also our, our, the color of our envelopes that we are hand delivering uh, without knocking on anyone's door. So in a safe, uh, health way, healthy way, we're hand delivering people these applications for absentee ballots in, uh, in fuchsia envelopes to their door to just take one step away. So all someone has to do, you know, if they're following us on Instagram, if they get a link to our website on Facebook, whatever, they go to a, a very easy form on our website, fill it out, give us their address, and then we will 
get that application to begin the absentee ballot process um, to them within three business days. So, and in many cases, we're now beating the Board of Elections for getting them that application. And a lot of people appreciate this because one, in this era of information overload, I do believe we've already in now almost 10 months of campaigning established ourselves, especially with this demographic of non-traditional voter as a trusted source of information. And people feel comfortable going to our site. The interface is really easy. And you know, they just they, they almost rather do that than navigate three different government sites and try to figure out what they're supposed to do. And so we have been hand delivering those. We've already delivered over a thousand of them. We have about 200 that are coming in every day. And you know, what's been really interesting there too is the new level of volunteer engagement. I, I referenced earlier how we've just had tremendous volunteer engagement all the way through. But it, as you know, with a lot of things that you do in organizing, it's kind of phases of people that kind of come in or the level of intensity in their engagement might vary. Well, it's been interesting in this, in this pandemic period and with the stay at home order in Ohio, that we are seeing people that you know had maybe heard about the campaign or only started to hear about it in the last week of GOTV and when we were able to run or finally run a TV ad, they learned about it. And now they're kind of excited because they're like, oh, I actually have time to help you. And what can I do? And is there anything that you know we could we could possibly support you on? And so we've created this little army of people that are helping us deliver these fuchsia envelopes. And it's the first time they've ever done anything related to the campaign, where I think some of our more traditional, what we call super organizers, were a little fatigued from all the GOTV efforts, but we've had this whole new crop of people show up in addition to some of our traditional volunteers, and it's been, it's been really, really cool. So, and a lot of people are coming because they, they tell me that they're excited to have a campaign where they're, they're an affirmative yes. It's not just picking you know, the lesser of two evils or you're just going down this democratic sample ballot and you vote Democrat because we have to vote Democrat, but you don't really have any level of enthusiasm. People have been hungry for a true grassroots campaign that reflects the values uh, of this community and of the issues of our time, Medicare for all, um, backing the Green New Deal, uh, making sure that people are in jobs that pay enough to live. And so the, my original thesis before launching the campaign that progressive values are the values of Central Ohio, and I believe the values of Ohioans generally, um, has proven to be the case in, in our district. And I'm really, really optimistic for our new date, April 28th, uh, I don't know what date after they start counting that we'll actually learn whether we win or not, but, um, but this is also the beginning of a longer journey of making sure that we have progressive candidates running, that you know, we continue to launch grassroots campaigns. And I was just talking to a voter today and, and the chase calls we're doing of people who have already requested their absentee ballot applications. And he had not heard about the campaign, but was just you know, everything I said is like, yes, we have to get, we have to get the money out of politics. We have to have grassroots candidates. And, and so, you know, very, very excited to see where we go from here. And, um, and again, just really excited that people were willing to this, again, a new crop of people learn about our race and, uh, and happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you so much, Morgan. That was great. So I am getting tons of chats and questions from folks. So let's, Let's dive in. So I'm going to go ahead. We have a great question here from Stephen uh, mm -hmm. Cirillo. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and mute you, Stephen, and ask for you to join us uh, via video so you can directly ask Morgan uh, your question yourself. So give me one second, and you are ready to go, Stephen. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I'll prefer, uh, let me see if I can do this. This is all, anyway, uh, if you can hear me, that's the most important part. Yes. <laughs> uh, I am a, <clears throat> I'm a respiratory therapist uh, and I work in Northern California. I am off the front lines at this point uh, after doing this work for 40 years, but I've been uh, I'm now in the high risk group, 65 years old with asthma. So anyway, the substance of the question has to do, of course, with um, Medicare for all. Now, mm -hmm. I'm in Northern California. That Medicare for all is not a quote unquote radical idea amongst most of my, most of the people I work with and most of the people I hang with. Mm -hmm. um, my question to you is do you, what are the signs you see that Medicare for all 
is gaining traction in your state. So that's basically it. Uh, basically, I guess I'd like to get a get your read on it. And because I do, I've worked in healthcare for a long time. Medicare for all is incredibly overdue. And um, I'd just like to hear how optimistic or pessimistic you may be on this issue. And that's it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question, Stephen, and glad to hear you're doing well. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a great question, and it's been a very interesting journey in talking about Medicare for All throughout the campaign because, like I said, I mean, for people, real working people, uh, a lot of whom in central Ohio had never heard the term Medicare for All, I'll be honest with you, when we were, you know, doing our grassroots campaigning and door knocking, uh, this was a new term to people. And, and, uh, and so actually I, and Adam and I were just emailing about this earlier today, I started referring to it more as universal healthcare because uh, sometimes people would, would be a little off put by Medicare for all specifically because they're like, well, wait a second, I have Medicare and I don't like Medicare. I'm still paying a lot of money, right? Why would you want to give more people Medicare, right? And it's like, okay, well, no, let's, let's talk about it as universal healthcare, everyone having coverage. But once we get beyond that buzzword thing, with it, which I, you know, is more semantic in some way, um, I do believe that most people here that I talk to completely agree with me. The resistance I get is from more de democratic political establishment players, locally, my opponent, who it, it's very odd, but true. And actually just a week before our original campaign, our original election date, I had a state legislature, Democratic, here at a civic association meeting, if you can picture it, in a little library at like 7 p.m. on a Tuesday, you know, in March, whatever, who I had all of these elderly people who were in that meeting who were agreeing with me about the need for everyone to have health care and then getting pushed back from this rep democratic representatives like talking about the right wing talking points of but this is just going to lead to to longer wait times don't let her fool you she's trying to trick you right and i was like what what's going on you know no actually that is that is not true or if it's true i mean we all are waiting for health care to some extent especially when if you have a you know a very um or a more complicated medical situation and we have to deprogram people from this thinking that like you said that medicare for all is somehow a radical idea everyone having health care is a radical idea it's not we don't have to live like this and what's been interesting is in this bonus period of campaigning that we've had during uh the the stay-at-home order with the coronavirus pandemic i i do sense, and I would wonder, uh, Cecilia, I guess, does, isn't talking in this session, but she's doing a lot of calls with me, so she's probably getting a sense of it too, it, a noticeable shift in the willingness of a typical profile of person who maybe would have been a little bit more resistant, let's call it like slightly more affluent. Some of, there are a couple zip codes in our district that are a little more affluent who would have been like, well, but Morgan, Medicare for all, maybe a little too much. Medicare for all who want it is really what we're okay with, right? And um, and they're starting to see, no, I mean, this isn't, this isn't acceptable. We can't, live like, we can't live like this. We can't allow people to be this vulnerable. And in fact, making that connection to other people's vulnerability actually being a reflection of all of our vulnerabilities, right? So uh, I'm optimistic there. We have had also one poll that was conducted by uh, Data for Progress, so an independent poll, not, you know, not getting paid by any campaign, um, that found 70% of Black people living in the third district, for example, were supportive of Medicare for all. And that was a statistic that I, in that meeting that I referenced at that civic association, was able to put right back on that legislator and say, because she was trying to also say that people don't want this here in Ohio, in central Ohio. I was like, well, and Black people in particular, I'm like, mm. Well, 70% of, of Black people said otherwise when asked by an independent source, right? So um, I, I really think that, you know, when I'm talking to people door to door, it, there's a tremendous amount of support for it. And now, like I said, in this era where a lot of us are thinking more critically about our public health system, about a profit-motivated um, health system in many ways, how it doesn't necessarily serve us as well as it could. Thank you, Morgan. Great. So I have another question coming in from Stacy Herzing. Stacy, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and ask you to join us uh, through your video. One second. And Stacy, you are with us. 
Hi, I've got um, a question regarding the Green New Deal and how, um, what kind, I've got, I guess I've got two parts. What kind of reception is it getting in general, like the, the idea of it in um, Central Ohio? And then I've got a second question or comment, which is um, the Green New Deal makes a lot of sense or seems to make a lot of sense to a lot of progressives or Democrats that I talk about. I personally do not think it's a strategic name in that it immediately gets the, the, um, the people on the other side, their hackles go up and they can't even listen to a conversation. They just attack it on the name without even listening to a conversation mm -hmm. on climate change or transitioning to jobs of the future mm -hmm. or anything else. So this is my second comment it has to do more with the Democratic Party and just uh, for initiatives and bills I really wish they would be a lot more strategic in how they name things, not just, I like this name, so let's name it this. Um, so I guess those are my two parts of that question. Great, thank you for the question, Stacy. Well, this one is similar, I would say, not a, not a very high level of awareness about the Green New Deal. So if I, if I or I, not if, when I was going around talking to people, it's, it's funny, it already feels quite distant to be going around and talking to people, right? But so when I was doing that, going around and, and door knocking and talking to people directly, um, a, lot of, a lot of people, if I just said the term Green New Deal, people here generally would have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. Virtually no awareness among the general population living here. Now, there is quite a well-organized, though somewhat small, climate activist community, climate change activist community that of course knows about it, that that's the reason why they invited me to speak at their, that the youth, the global youth climate strike rally that they had in September, I was the only political figure that was invited to that event because they have never ever aligned with any even democratic political figure here because they never have a strong climate agenda, right? So um, I was invited to speak at that because I do back the Green New Deal. And so with that community, there is a strong level of awareness, but generally I would say Green New Deal has virtually no meaning um, to most people living here. And I agree with you leading into your second part of your question. Um, and if anything, there's a little bit like, well, what does that mean? And that sounds like a really big complicated thing, right? Uh, quick, quick story there, I had a, a friend who is supportive of the campaign living here. I don't know how he would necessarily identify politically. I, I think that's also pretty common here. There's quite an independent streak here in Columbus of people that don't necessarily like to publicly be put in a, in a specific box, but uh, maybe Republican at some points in his life. And when I first said, you know, Green New Deal is going to be on the platform, he was just like, oh God, no, Morgan, that's just that's just radical. Again, radical thinking. No, you can't go. That's too far, too far. And I was like, well, do you know what the Green New Deal is saying? And you're like, no, no idea, no idea, right? Was, okay, so then he goes back, I'm like, go read it, get back to me. And he's essentially comes back, says, oh, well, oh, well, this makes sense. Climate change is happening. There's something we can do about it. And there's also a way to create jobs for people, economic opportunity, et cetera, makes a lot of sense. Okay, so that's usually how I'm breaking it down and talking about it with people who Green New Deal doesn't have meaning to. And I will say that when you break it down in those terms, past the buzzword, uh, people are, are very supportive of it because especially here in the third district uh, where wages have been stagnating since the last recession, uh, when, you, when you talk about jobs guarantee, when you talk about jobs that pay enough to live, when you talk about jobs of the future and sectors that could actually lead to career building opportunities, not just dead end retail jobs that are paying anywhere near the state minimum wage of under $10 an hour, people's ears definitely part. And so that's how I usually, usually was talking about it. And I agree with you. I, I don't know when these marketing decisions are made or if they're ever intentional. I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, based on my experience of federal government, sometimes there's not as much thought put into them as maybe there should be. But, um, but I agree with you. I think we, we need to be considering that, you know, the, in terms of the language and, and how almost market tested a little bit, because especially as you start to take these ideas places where folks aren't as up on the political news cycle and all of that, it, it needs to be clear. It needs to be easy to understand. Um, and it needs to be persuadable, you know, so that we can build broad coalitions of support. But I think that's another thing that our campaign has been able to do. And I try to plant the seed, you know, yes, I'm running on this and I want, I hope that you'll support me for this reason. Everybody agrees we've got to do something about the climate crisis. 
But I also want people to start asking every single person they're electing at any level of government, what is your climate plan? And telling them if they don't have one, then that is not someone that you should be electing, right? Everyone who is running for any political office at this point at any level of government needs to be talking about climate change and what they're gonna do about it. So, um, and then the, just the other thing that I would say there from a tactical point of view, we also have tried to connect some of these political or policy concepts that maybe aren't as top of mind for people to very concrete stats. And, and one that we used on climate change on the Green New Deal in particular that you'll see on our website too is that Central Ohio, Franklin County is in the asthma belt. We have very high rates of asthma here, kids missing thousands of days of school due to uh, asthma and that connects to poor air quality so that people see, yes, climate change is happening. We're already feeling the effects of this. I think that point has been made even more clear, the risk there for certain communities. It's you know usually in more black neighborhoods where these higher asthma rates are that already have a legacy of uh, poor environmental uh, uh, management of you know former industrial sites and that kind of thing that we're now seeing the risk connected to the corona virus, right? That you're not going to necessarily be able to manage that if you do contract it as well. And so um, that's something that I, I found was helpful too. A lot of people's like, yeah, climate change, climate change, climate change is like, no, but your kid having asthma right now, that is part of this, right? And so um, that, that's, we saw some success with that as well. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Next question is coming from Jerry Maidas. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing the last name. I'm sorry. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to join us via video and unmute you. Uh, Jerry, go ahead, please. Hi. Um, okay. Whoops. Not quite sure what's happening here. All right. My question Jerry, you is, Hi, Jerry. <laughs> there you go. My question is, what are the two or three issues on which you most vehemently disagree with your opponent? And what's the nature of the disagreement? Hmm, well, there are a few. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, yeah. Well, first key difference is the not taking corporate money thing. So it's actually been intriguing to me throughout the campaign how uh, in response to my critique that <laughs> my opponent takes 80% of her money from corporations and connecting this to the overall uh, outcomes we see in Washington, that her response has been to double down on the collection of corporate PAC money. Uh, and I mean, to a, a very publicly, unabashedly, right? You know, continuing to have fundraisers um, here in Columbus where, you know, the minimum connects to, you know, $5,000 PAC donation. Uh, getting donations and having events in Washington through the CBC um, in, in conjunction with the, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus where there are $20,000 PAC minimums or pooling PAC money, I guess. And, uh, and th that, that's been pretty interesting. And I would say I continue to very much disagree with that. So uh, that is a big difference and one that I highlight when talking to voters between me and my opponent. From a policy perspective, she had those she signed on to medicare for all at some point she attacked me in a new york times article about the race early on last fall for um giving people a pipe dream saying medicare for all universal health care is possible and throughout the campaign has slowly backtracked on that you know any level of support for medicare for all and uh and i i think at this point even she would agree that she does not support Medicare for all and, um, and, the, and has waffled in that position you know, quite a bit. So that's a, that's a key policy difference for us as well. Green New Deal, those were not words that she uttered before I launched this campaign. Since I launched the campaign and in fact the first debate, we've had, we had four candidate forums, they're called not debate. We had four debates that were scheduled for this race. Two she showed up for, two she skipped. In the first one, uh, she did reference that she's all in support of the Green New Deal. And this was what, been one of her strategies is just co-opt a lot of the progressive ideas that I was talking about and pretend like she was always in favor of them. So she's always been in support of the Green New Deal, though she didn't um, join on to it and had never talked about it. Um, the only issue she had with it was that it didn't include provisions for housing. And she told a story about going down to AOC's office and once they hashed that out and AOC agreed to add some, some um, components about housing, she was all for it, which 
I then pointed out, well, interesting, because, you know, the other attack has been, you know, maybe not having as much experience, but you've just told us as our eight or four term congresswoman is now going down stairs to talk to a freshman congresswoman to tweak her climate platform, um, not to suggest a bold uh, idea of your own. So um, that would be another key policy distinction between us. But overall, I also say that I am not going to sell out this community. And the reality is my opponent has taken um, money from industries that I don't support related to fossil fuels, related to the healthcare industry. She and her husband have made money off of the payday lending industry uh, when she was in the state house as the minority leader and had a chance to block payday lending, uh, payday lending at the state level throughout the whole state of Ohio before the financial crisis. Um, she, in fact, was the Democrat that other Democrats went on record saying we would have been able to pass this legislation, make it more powerful, but for our minority leader. And her husband was a registered lobbyist for the payday lending industry. That I truly can't accept. And it was one of the things that made me feel like I had to do this, um, especially having worked at the CFPB. And also, you know, being in a position, owning property, their family that could have been used or at least some percentage of um, to build affordable housing, but instead using political positions to then broker uh, market rate housing deals and, and profit off of property ownership without doing anything to serve the community. That's another thing that came up during the race that was independently reported. And, uh, and I'm making a commitment to not use my political position to enrich myself. And, and her net worth has quadrupled to over $10 million in the course of her term in Congress. Thank you. Perfect. Our next question comes from Doug Krieger. Doug, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and ask you to join us uh, via video. Go ahead, Doug. Hi. Hello. Now it's so big. I like the little boxes. Um, one thing to the one of the questions earlier, um, and I've seen this in, with a lot of uh, candidates, uh, particularly in mailers, it's bullet points. Green New Deal, Medicare, uh, whatever the different issues are. And I always feel, what is that, forget what it means, what specifically is your position on those things that don't seem to get articulated on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. and, and so it sort of makes everybody uh, that's sort of on the progressive side look like they're just sort of following a script. Right. Um, so that's one question. And, and the other question I had was how does your opponent's uh, voting record match up with the corporate contributions? Mm -hmm. uh, are, is, he, is, that, is the woman there to really do their bidding or is it for the people of your district? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and forgive me, on the first question, so sorry, what is the question on the first point? Is it whether- well, you How can you be more specific to get your message across instead of the usual bullet points uh, Got it. Got that you believe in, you know. Yeah. Well, that's where, you know, and it, it's an interesting balance between uh, too much information, because I find, especially when people, the, the overall policy idea or for people who aren't thinking about policy and this is a challenge for me especially having been in professional environments with only people who think about policy is striking that balance between getting the information out and enough to support the position I agree with you a little bit more detail is helpful without overwhelming people and um, and so that's something that we try to do on our website especially in the beginning is providing a little bit of, of meat, so to speak, um, to break down what we are talking about and also make the case for what we are talking about. Like I mentioned with the, the asthma data, for example, connected to um, the Green New Deal. Um, but otherwise, I found the most effective thing uh, is efficient, <laughs> but, um, but we've tried to break some of these things down, talking to people directly through social media. So we put a, a big emphasis, emphasis on social media throughout the entire campaign. But in addition to the door knocking, holding these community rallies, uh, for the last 12 weeks of the campaign, I believe we were doing them every weekend, every Saturday night. And that was a really effective way because then you know, there's a back and forth, there's a question. It's very old school, and, um, but I just thought that was the most, the most powerful way for people to understand what we were talking about or the meet and greets and the community rally. So we were doing meet and greets throughout, though I will say, given the political climate here, not, I didn't always have people that would be willing to 
publicly support me to the extent of hosting a meet and greet because they're also scared of retaliation. But for those who would, we were doing those throughout. And then as a campaign, we were having those community rallies every weekend. And we were getting, you know, in some cases, over 50 people that were showing up to those uh, on Saturdays and were really able to, to talk through a lot of policy issues. Um, and these were not with people that were wonky people by any means, just, you know, day to day working people who want to get into the issues and, and want their representative to have some substance because I think people are are sick of the traditional Politico kind of personality. What I've called in some points of the campaign, like ceremonial leadership here, that is the norm in Central Ohio. And I just, I, I believe that people are really over it and want to just have representatives that are ready to get to work. Um, on the second question related to voting record, so one specific example that I reference, for the most part, my opponent is voting a lot of, you know, Democrat middle of the, the road kind of, um, kind of votes, but her only substantive committee that she sits on is the Financial Services Committee. And on that committee, uh, she does have votes that align more closely with the financial services industry um, than on uh, consumer protection side, let's say. So one specific example, um, and in fact, just a, I believe a month or two after having a fundraiser that was hosted by the Auto Lender Dealers Association, she was one of the few Democrats that signed on to a bill that would have or she actually co-sponsored, not just like that, she was co-sponsoring a bill that weakened the CFPB's authority to go after auto lenders that were discriminating against people of color. Um, earlier, Obama had advised against it, NAACP had advised against it, uh, and she was one of the co-sponsors. And uh, Columbus is a big financial services town. She takes PAC money from virtually all of the financial institutions that are present here. Um, and so that's that's one. And, and that came up in our second debate. And again, no, no response. Um, and Trump ultimately signed that into law. So um, there are, there are examples, but they are more, yeah, more connected, I would say, to the influence from her, her money from the financial services industry. But overall, just to say the point that even, even the, the democratic voting to me is a strategic liability because this is one of the most safely democratic districts in the entire country. So if we have someone who's representing that, who really leans much more in the moderate direction, who is more on the side of protecting financial institutions than going for a bolder uh, consumer protection agenda, then that's a, real, that's a real risk for the whole country because we need to have people who are in a position to do so very safely that are using their positions to the maximum ability. And she does not do that on any issue, really. Perfect. Thank you. We are on a roll with amazing questions. So up next, uh, and forgive me as I'm getting through all your questions and still trying to keep this short and sweet. Uh, Jessica Hill, you are up next, please. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you uh, and ask you to join us on the video. Jessica, go ahead. Hi, Jessica. Hi. Hello. What's Hi, your name, yeah. Morgan, please? Uh oh. You're on mute. Oh, oh my gosh. Okay, yeah. I think you're back. Okay. Hi. Um, my question um, is about kind of corporate capture of, I guess, well, you can address either or um, or both. Um, some government agencies, as well as the media, maybe we can focus on government. Um, but I'm thinking particularly the pharmaceutical industry and the telecommunications industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that, because that's an issue I feel like I don't hear much from Democrats on, even progressive ones. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just kind of any thoughts. Yeah. Well, the pharmaceutical one in particular, I mean, and that's another industry that my opponent does take money from. Um, like I said, over she's taking over two hundred thousand dollars from the healthcare industry, and I put in that bucket insurance and also pharmaceutical. And you can't really talk about changing the healthcare system without addressing pharmaceuticals. That's one of the primary cost drivers. And so, um, having representatives that are taking money from this industry that are also then responsible for developing policy that's going to make sure we keep costs under control just doesn't 
make really any sense to me. And I think increasingly it's not making much sense to most people living in this country, which is a good thing so that we can actually pass legislation to change it. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's a, it's a really, it's a really big issue. And I, 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 I haven't worked in that part of the federal government that regulates either of the areas that you talked about, but I can just speak to my time at Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which um, is an agent, well, it still is an agency full of people in many ways who care about doing everything they can to make government work for people that the leadership doesn't reflect that anymore. Um, but I'll say that was a lesson for me, just seeing the constant stream of, um, of corporations, companies that were able to come in and make sure that their voices were heard in the regulatory process. And that is their right to do so, right? Um, but you know, only when you have an agency that's as focused on making sure that you hear the consumer perspective through having a robust consumer complaint uh, analytics department by making sure you're regularly meeting with the consumer groups, can you actually balance that influence out? And it, it means to me, and that's what I was saying at the beginning, my takeaway is that's just dependent on the leadership of these agencies, right? So what we need to absolutely protect is our representatives not also having the influence in the ear of corporations constantly and taking corporate donations. Because if they're doing that to the tune of 80% of their money, like my opponent, we are, we people are losing before the conversation even gets started because we can't afford to go to Washington all the time. Um, so, you know, having, having any of our branches of government um, co-opted by corporations and, um, and having that level of influence is problematic. But I would say, especially the positions that we, the people, have control over choosing who occupies those roles, we cannot stand for that. And so, um, and that, that really holds for any industry that we're talking about. So that's why I would say it's a blanket, no money from corporations to ensure that we're preserving our representation in Congress for us. Thank you, Morgan. We're gonna move to one last question, please forgive me if I haven't gotten into yours. Um, we're going a little bit over, so I appreciate and thank you for your time, but we are all having such a good time here together. So last question, Robert Neal, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, sir, and ask you to join us uh, on video to ask Maureen your question. Robert? Go ahead. Robert Neal? <laughs> Robert Neal? Uh -oh. Okay, yeah. Robert? Okay, well, I will ask Robert's question. Uh, Robert, uh, Morgan, Robert Neal would like to know what polling you have and what that looks like. Robert Neal, please support our campaign so we can afford polling. <laughs> not kidding. <laughs> kidding, not kidding. No. So we haven't done any polling on our own. Uh, I, as I'm sure you all can imagine, once we learned we had a new election date that was six weeks after the one that we had originally budgeted for, that put us in a uh, precarious financial situation. So I don't anticipate doing any polling before April 28th. But uh, I will say that my opponent did a lot of polling throughout the entire race. As soon as she started taking this race seriously, which had her fundraising results where we outraised her, uh, she consistently polled throughout the entire race and then ultimately ended with push polling that's trying to plant uh, negative and, and, and in all of the cases actually untrue information about me suggesting that I'm somehow responsible for high pharmaceutical costs because I worked at a law firm for two years as a junior associate, for example. So her polling didn't stop, um, which was a sign to us that they weren't getting any comfort around what they were learning. She's already spent $1.5 million on the race, but we don't have, and we hadn't conducted any independent polling of our own. Um, and then, you know, just final thing I'll say there, we did feel like you know, we had a tremendous amount of momentum going into the final day. And it's been interesting in this last stage, as, as soon as we figured out what our game plan was gonna be in this extra time period for the campaign, we realized that in many ways it's a gift because our biggest challenge, and you, if you've had a chance to see any media coverage about the race has been identified in some of it, it's almost feels in many ways like I'm in a race against myself <laughs> because um, there's not a lot of awareness of what Joyce Beatty does or what she stands for 
So, but because I put myself out here as, hey, I have this vision of what we should be doing in government and here's who I am, then often the metric is, well, do we, do we buy into what Morgan's saying? But it's not necessarily a, a, um, a competition against Joyce Beatty, which is, which is weird, but anyway. And all to say that the challenge is building name ID, that people know about me, that they know that I'm running because the Democratic Party here spends resources sending out mailers and sample ballots that only feature the endorsed Democratic candidates. It'll come as no surprise that my opponent is the endorsed Democratic candidate in this case. So a lot of people wouldn't even necessarily know that they had another choice until that moment that they see the real ballot, not that sample ballot. And on an election day, that's a more traditional election day here where people are showing up in person to the polls before they go to work or on a lunch break, that could be a very harried moment for them. And they're just like, oh, Joyce Beatty is a name I've heard before. Who is this other person? Whatever, I'm voting for Joyce Beatty. But the absentee only option slows down the clock a little bit. And people are at home. And if they have internet, they have the ability to look up and research their choices. And then we get data every day from the Board of Elections about whose application for an absentee ballot has been processed and we can call them. So the more you know, resources we get, all the resources we get from this point out is just going towards um, increasing our capability around outreach to these voters. And we're finding on calls, anecdotally of course, because like I said, we don't have any hard data around the polling numbers, but I am talking to people regularly that this is their first time learning of the campaign because they weren't in our target universe necessarily. And once they hear they have a choice for the third district and it's a progressive one, they're like, oh yeah, of course, right? Um, and you know, so, so grateful that we called and let them know about this. In addition to people that we had never talked to or identified before in our target universe who are also supportive because they heard about it in media or whatever, but it almost feels like we're just getting lucky charms, you know, every time we get on the phone every day now, I'm like, yes, we got another one who hadn't heard about it. And this isn't someone that we necessarily would have been able to intercept um, before March 17th or on that polling, the polling um, or the, the official election day. Thank you. Perfect. So let me, uh, Morgan, we're going to go ahead and move to wrapping it up right now. I'm going to turn it over to our co-founder, Adam Green, to say a few uh, last thoughts. I will just say this before I turn it over to Adam. Uh, Morgan, someone uh, messaged me and said, you are very impressive and one day you will be president. I won't be surprised by that. And someone else said, thank you for pulling this together and they are going to donate now. So I wanted to tell you <laughs> those two things. Okay, so let me turn over to our co-founder, Adam, for a few uh, last thoughts. Adam? Great. Thanks, Rachel. And Morgan, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, you know, folks who have been listening to this whole thing, um, you know, I want to say when we got the PCCC off the ground about 11 years ago, and my co-founder Stephanie and I were thinking about, you know, what our criteria were for endorsement, we pretty much decided that there were three boxes that we wanted to be able to check. One is the question, you know, is somebody a bold progressive? which for us isn't just a value statement, it's a question of leadership and effectiveness, right? Can they exert power on behalf of progressive values? Uh, which is why we love Elizabeth Warren so much and you know, something that we try to hold out for other candidates we endorse. Another is an on paper assessment of, is there a path to victory, right? Sometimes there's a great candidate running in a 70% Republican district and you know, we have to make choices about where we put our time and resources. Clearly here, basically the primary is the general, and you know, there, there's a path to victory in the primary, clearly. And then the last question was competence of campaign. Is someone running an effective best practices operation so that if we, if we vouch for them, if we ask our members, some of whom can only donate $3, to donate $3 to a campaign, you know, can we feel good that that money will be used wisely? You've been on this Zoom for the last hour, and you've heard that Morgan knows these issues cold. Right? She is a true believer, a true you know, keeper of the flame. Um, you know, not only does she have the bullets about Green New Deal, but you heard her connect the dots between corporate contributions and then outcomes on everything from big insurance to pharma to fossil fuels um, and you know, things in her community. Um, you, know, you heard her go into the policy weeds, holding her, her opponent accountable for voting to neuter the CFPB when it came to the auto insurance industry below the radar of most voters but you know, many people will be hurt by that and, and her willingness to hold her opponent accountable on stage. And you heard so many anecdotes that represent the competency of her, her campaign, sharing anecdotes of things she heard at the door 
back when there was such a thing as knocking on doors. So, you know, the thing that I would just put on the table is imagine being a bold progressive, having a path to viability, wanting a best practices campaign, spending down so you're leaving everything on the field, going to March 17th election day, and then having the date shift. You know, even having out fundraise your incumbent opponent and then getting to basically zero dollars and then having the date shift. That is why we need to step up if we believe in having someone like Morgan in Congress. You know, for all of us, we have to make choices. You know, there are people who might be like, you know, I'll give $10 to one candidate and 100 to another. I'll decide who fits in what bucket. You know, others might be, oh, I'll give $100 to some and $1,000 to some. You know, we would earnestly ask you if you are inspired by what you heard today to believe in Morgan and to give the maximal that you can give. Because this, this could be a game changer, right? You know, we were one of the groups that weren't that involved in the AOC race, thinking it can never be won. And boy, we saw the impact of what one new, you know, chess piece on the board can be for the entire progressive movement in national conversation. You know, we, we would vouch that for Morgan. So, um, you know, Morgan, thank you so much for joining us and for being such an inspirational keeper of the flame. Uh, thank you for... Are you doing your trick again? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for organizing. <laughs> the special effects now work. That's cool. <laughs> that is really cool. Thank you. And my final question to you would be this. For those who are thinking about donating, can you, you know, as you close out, what can those final dollars do in the final, you know, two weeks? If people yeah. want to yeah, no, and I just have to emphasize again to Adam and the whole PCCC team, I, what I what this endorsement means because it is a validator of all the things that you just said on this. It works on the same way for us that um, it shows people, and in many ways in Columbus, people care about these national endorsements more than some of the local ones. Uh, it is just a sign that people really believe in you and then it makes others believe too. So thank you again for your support. What this means for us is really, can we continue to get our message out? Uh, like Adam said, we budgeted to March 17th. I, um, though I've been a working professional, I'm not uh, of unlimited resources here. And so I'm kind of like at the max out of what I can also personally do to, to keep us going. But we are trying to get the word out to as many people as possible. My opponent has already restarted TV ads. She's running three ads every day in many cases on TV. So we would love to be able to get the ad that we've created, which actually you can see on our I believe it's pinned on our um, Twitter account right now and then also on our Facebook page. And we're trying to get that back on TV for the next week and a half. And it's all about trying to increase turnout. The other positive change from this new election date is that our win number essentially changed overnight. So whereas usually there are 120,000 people voting in this Democratic primary, only 23,000 had voted before the first election date. And almost certainly due to the complications of the voting process and all the other things that people are dealing with right now, we know that that number is now going to be probably closer to between 50 and 60,000 people overall voting in the primary, which is good for us. So the more people that we can get who are supportive who vote, um, of course, then you know we're gonna get to the majority number faster. So TV ads, we're trying to get our TV ad back on, on for the next week and a half as much as possible. Um, she, also, she's running radio ads. We were doing radio ads too before the first election date. If we can raise the resources, we could put that on as well. And then just hitting the dialer. We're using a dialer to try to get through the phone numbers as quickly as possible and keep up honestly just with the expenses that we need to maintain daily operations. So those are, those are the things that we're really focused on. We've been able to keep our whole staff on so far, but anything that anybody can do to chip in would go into um, those three buckets. And I'll say, I mean, in many ways, I consider this the enfranchisement process of voters in the third district. You would think this would be the work of the party, um, but we're having our grassroots campaign. I, before we started the Zoom, I was actually responding to an Instagram message with somebody that was confused about whether or not their ballot was still coming. I mean, we are making sure that people know how to vote right now as well. And of course, I hope they vote for me, but also just making sure they understand the absentee process. Like I said, especially if we're working into um, all mail-in voting in, in November as well. So really would appreciate any support, anything that anybody can do. I know some people on this call have already supported. I'm very grateful for that. And we're, we're ready to win this thing. I, I can't tell you how, how much I love our team, love our community that stepped up and supported us. And we just are so excited to take this thing home on April 28th. So thank you. 
Thank you so, so much. Um, and especially, most importantly, thank you to all of our members that took the time to engage here with, with Morgan tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, we've made it easy. If you are inspired what you, by what you heard, which we think you are, uh, we have put a donate link in the chat box. If that's something you'd consider, uh, we'd be grateful. So check out the chat box, donate if you like what you heard. Thank you so, so much for taking the time uh, to be here with us. And this is going to be something ongoing that the P-TRIP is doing. Um, we had a superstar with Morgan to kick off this new program. And please keep your eyes open for uh, information on the next call. Thank you so much. Be well. Be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 <laughs>